Hello friends, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Raymond Nikola Trust podcast. My name is Gavrilo Nikolic and every month I bring you inspiring conversations about the future of education, science and philanthropy from world top academics, scientists, Nobel Prize winners and philanthropists. My guest today is Dr. Caroline Cobalt. Dr. Caroline Cobalt is a research fellow investigating food in the 19th and 20th centuries and the mutual interactions of science, commerce, industry, government, journalism, culture, and law. She completed the PhD studies of history of science at Cambridge University after an early career in journalism. She has also been actively involved in community work, including leading a groundbreaking coastal planning partnership, serving as a governor for primary and secondary school, and working as a volunteer at a homeless hostel. Dr. Kobold is a council member of the Society for the History of Alchemy and Chemistry and was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts in 2016 for her work on climate change mitigation and community engagement. If you are curious to learn more about Caroline and the history of food, you need to listen to this episode. In just a moment, the one and only Dr. Caroline Cobalt. Caroline, welcome to the RT podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me. Let us start with basics. Where are you currently and what are you doing? Okay, um, so currently right now I'm sitting um, at my home, which is on the south coast of uh, the UK. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of head down at the moment in a lot of work post COP26, which is the big climate change conference, um, looking um, at helping sort of my local community face the... Uh, consequences of climate change really um academically i'm still involved with my college in cambridge where i focus on sort of the history of food and how it's changed particularly as it's be- become more sort of scientific and technologically based um in the last two centuries i'm curious because you have quite a mixed background if i can call it that way how would you describe yourself a scientist journalist environmental activist or philanthropist or a bit of all four <laughs> i think or a bit a bit or a lot of all of them um i have to say i've spent my whole life fighting boxes and boundaries um in in our society generally i just think um that, that i don't like being sort of put into one particular pigeonhole um, I think it's very important for everybody to think in a as broad a way as possible while obviously looking in detail at you know areas they become involved in I think you said pretty much confirms how our societies have developed especially over the last 30 years if you look at the longer younger generation um, to which I think I belong because I was born after the fall of Berlin Wall uh, I think a lot you of people are to the younger generation then, yeah. <laughs> definitely uh, so if you look at that it, it looks like people are nowadays becoming more and more generalist and taking interest in different fields and combining them through their career which was not the fact uh, b- before 1990 where people would kind of you know uh, if they were a doctor or a nurse they would be nurse for 30 years not even considering switching careers at one point no no i think you're very right and and, and I, I i i definitely found that i mean i i went um to university in the early 1980s and I already found myself then in a bit of a difficult position because I for what we in the UK called A levels I'd concentrated on physics maths and history and people found that very difficult to to understand how somebody interested in physics and, and maths could be interested in history um, but I think that mold is now breaking and people realize that actually it, it's very valuable to be interested in and see the picture from different people's perspective. You mentioned already, and I mentioned in the, in the introduction to our conversation, that you started your professional career as a journalist. When did you originally took interest in journalism? 
okay, so my my degree was in mechanical engineering. Um, I think I think basically because I had a crush on Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who was a great engineer in the 19th century. Um, so I went to do engineering and it was while I was doing engineering, um, I, I actually did a, a small module in the history of engineering and science um, and found that actually... I felt at that stage my skill set was much more in terms of writing and communication. Um, and so it was then, I think in my third year at university, I decided that actually I wanted to be a journalist, um, focusing, I think, on on science. Um, uh, yeah, but, but even then was very difficult trying to convince publishers or media companies that having done engineering, I could actually read and write. Um, so it was a difficult entry, but once I was in there, actually, I realized that I was playing to my strengths. What prompted you to study the history of science and food in particular? Uh, okay, so that was a slightly circuitous route. Um, I had had um, a 20-year career in journalism at that point, um, but actually realized um, I was being constrained um, in in journalism because there are so many vested interests and some of it was at the time of before the financial crash and I was a financial risk management journalist and I could see some of the things that were going to happen um, and the dangers out there but felt I, I, I was being stopped from writing about them because of um, certain advertisers for our, the journal I was writing to and, and, and everything. So at that point, um, I was helping my daughter look for university courses to study and came across, actually, it was a master's course in the history of science and thought, wow, that would be fantastic to do. Um, and because of my background, you know, way back in my youth, um, looking at sort of people in history and how they contributed to science and technology in society. Um, and I realized I could do the course part time, which would allow me to continue with my career as a journalist, but then but actually do a bit of something I really wanted to do. Um, and it went from there, really. Quite interesting. Before we continue with your story and investigate a bit more uh, when and how did you decide to change your career in journalism with a career in academia, I just wanted to mention one thing that came to my mind when you were uh, saying that you were prevented from doing some of the articles because of the vested interest. Um, the, the thing we can see today because of, obviously, the, the fact that we all live in a virtual world and that we are all interconnected, I think that has in some way changed uh, journalism for good because you have a lot of opportunities, especially young people have a lot of opportunities to share their opinions and to become stars of their own universe uh, by pretty much uh, standing for something they believe it is right. But it can also be the other way around, that they uh, pretty much share, share opinion and be uh, kind of quoted on, on that wrong opinion, an opinion that is not acceptable by majority uh, all the way through through their life. Oh no, absolutely. I mean, and journalism and the the communication of facts and 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 thoughts has changed hugely. So, for the good and and for the bad, in the sense that it's the communication of news and facts is no longer dominated by a few main mainstream media players, and we can all uh, turn to the internet to communicate, which has to be beneficial the disadvantage of course is there is a it, it is as a journalist um you do get fact checked by your sub editor and your editor so um and and it, the journal i wrote for you had you could only use named sources so um it it, it there was some sort of censorship in keeping the uh, reality out there in this in a sense you couldn't just write anything um, so I would say to anybody and this is this is a this is something I've learned from both journalism and history is always check your sources so when you read anything on the internet try and understand where that has come from who is publishing it um, whether they have any vested interests themselves in publishing it or putting it out there. Um, so I think if people are very clued up, um, th th they are, you know, navigating the internet is a skill that, that needs to be learned um, 
by everybody, um, if you see what I mean. Fully agree with you. I think uh, next to internet, also coding uh, is is a quite valuable skill that uh, kids nowadays needs to learn. And like it was maybe your generation uh, to start learning how to navigate through internet and how to use uh, cell phones. For my yeah. generation, will coding be, uh, let's say, uh, next uh, uh, challenge that we would need to conquer in all, all the all, all, all in order to to stay up to date uh, and and not not be outdated and outcasted by our uh, young, younger versions of ourselves. I think younger people are much more clued up when they read stuff on on the internet than, say, my generation, where prior to um, reading stuff on the internet, we just saw it on our main news stream in newspapers or on the television or on the radio, and there was an assumption that this was the truth, whatever the truth is. Um, So when we read stuff on the internet, maybe we're not... um, as clued up as younger people to understand that what's put out there is not always um, factually checked and correct. What also plays a big role, I think, today is definitely artificial intelligence. And the fact if you're reading one article, you're likely going to continue to be reading articles represented by a same, let's say, uh, line of thought, uh, yep. which is yep. quite interesting because in the end of the day, um, if if you do a short, let's say, survey, uh, not directly, but indirectly with your close, uh, uh, let's say, circle of friends or family, um, if, if they, you know, start reading about the COVID vaccine in a negative way, they're probably going to continue sharing those news uh, all, all the way until uh, until next six, seven months or, or I, what? Who, who know, probably for the rest of the century, because the debate on COVID vaccine will probably continue and hunt us uh, for the majority of this yeah. century as well Um, so they're kind of not thinking in that way that maybe what i'm reading uh, is not factual and maybe i'm reading it because i'm coming to these articles through artificial intelligence that is pretty much serving this to me so i think we are now lacking not only the sense to fact check everything we read but also says that somebody is literally like in the restaurant serving an article to us and we're not even questioning why i came across this article You're right. You, you you get stuck in your own paradigm and echo chamber, not realizing that there are plenty of views out there. And again, I think that's a skill that we all need to learn and be taught is that to just make sure when we're on the Internet and searching for things or being interested in things, we actually look deliberately go out and search out alternative views um, so that we don't end up in that echo chamber of our own making, if you see I think it became clear to our listeners why you decide to switch a career in journalism with a career in academia. And in that process, you actually decided to focus further on studying science, in particular, the history of food. So my next question goes in that direction. Why mm-hmm. it is it important to study history of food? Uh, why? Because if you think about it, food is consumed by everybody, you know, across the whole world. And what what more important thing can there be to inform us about our history than something like food, which we all have to engage in? Um, and, and we can learn such a lot from looking at food and its past and how it's how it's changed because of how science has changed, how people's concept have changed how uh, the way people eat where they get their food from um, it's a fascinating lens through which to look at history that's quite impressive i never thought about it in that way uh, but i fully agree with you so it's the one common thing we all have and that is that we all need to eat in order to survive Mm -hmm. and if we do not understand what we eat and uh, how we came to eat the food that we are putting on our table will never be appreciative uh, of, of how the history of food developed and how it, it has actually uh, impacted the way we think about the food today. Yeah. You are studying specifically the food of late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, mm-hmm. Why did you decide to study the history of this uh, phase of human and societal development? Okay, so um, studying the, the the history of food in this period, mainly in the West, so Europe uh, and America, um, there was a lot going on in terms of where people lived um, and people were moving from the countryside into cities as industrialization took part. So they were becoming, there were several things going on which impacted food. So first of all, you have huge numbers of people 
moving from the countryside into big cities, so becoming much more removed from the source of their food. Um, so in the so from say the 1830s, where people would know the farmer giving them their milk or helping and the miller producing them their bread, they went in a relatively short period of time to knowing where their food came from and actually knowing the people producing their food who moving into a city where they had no idea where the food was coming from. Um, so there was that going on. There was also, of course, the the supply chain. We know all about supply chains at the moment, but the supply chain was getting much, much longer. So, so that introduced two other issues. First of all, how do you keep the food fresh when it has to move from a farm 100 miles away from a city uh, and, and and therefore the technology of food changed because they, of the need the need to keep food fresh. So you saw the beginning of things like canning food. By the end of the century, you had freezing food. You had chemicals being put into the food in order to help preserve them and kill the bacteria. Um, so there was that aspect going on. Also, as the food moved from person to person, so if you took milk. The milk came from the the cow to the farmer, then to a to a wholesale supplier who would move it into the city. And often there would be three or four people from that stage before the, the milk actually get got drunk, which produced other issues along the way. So often, in order and and in order to make money, the wholesaler might water down the milk, um, and then. So, so you had the fear of contamination and or watering down of food going on in order to increase profits um, as the whole food market became much more competitive. Um, so it, it, in many ways, it's a very interesting time period to look at how our food changed. This makes for a great introduction. Um, I never thought about how the change from 19th to 20th century um, or what the change from 19th to 20th century meant for the human race because uh, we actually switched then for, uh, let's say, the, the, the world transitioning uh, from one way of thinking and, and doing business and, and commercial affairs to completely another stage of our human evolution. And I, I fully agree with what you said. So it's it's quite amazing to think how complicated actually supply chain has become over the, uh, let's say, a place of a few decades at the, uh, in that, uh, that era um, and how actually the supply chains did not change since then that much. Yep, yep. And, and already in the 19th century, food was was traveling vast distances um you know ac across continents or from one continent to another continent um in a way that hadn't really been seen on that sort of mass industrial scale before how the interaction of science commerce industry government journalism culture and law i think i i have numbered them all has changed the history of our food that all those aspects started appearing in how food was regulated, how food was seen, how food was managed, really in that in the 19th century. So you began to see um, governments have always been interested in food. I mean, in the whole ever since governments existed, um, because being able to feed your population was crucial. And many a war was started because of lack of food or access to food. So government regulation has always been there, but became much more entrenched um, and structured in the 19th century um, because of concerns about where the food was coming from, how the food was being, um, this is a very 19th century term, but how the food was being adulterated or contaminated, either deliberately um, or accidentally. So you started looking, government started looking at how they could assess the quality of food and they brought and they introduced um, public chemists to look at what was in the food whether the food was um, being was cheating the public because of things being put in like water into milk um, or or even endangering the public um, you know we saw in the early 19th century things like arsenic and lead being used to color food which obviously was pretty toxic um, so so you then started getting uh, scientists involved 
Um, and so scientists began to be mediators of what was food and what wasn't food. Um, you've got governments. You then also got the start of big food companies actually manufacturing food products. Um, so, you know, the big biscuit companies and tinned food companies um, began to be um, incorporated in the 19th century and they advertised because they were in a competitive market so they began to advertise food in journals and magazines that were becoming um, much more available to people right across um, society you know so it wasn't just wealthy people who could afford to buy publications where they could see ad advertisements it, it went right down and, and and the greater proportion of the public were able to read um, so you then got uh, lawyers involved because companies would choose to patent their food so that nobody else could steal the product they'd invented um, and, and and then all all these all these different groups um, so from the manufacturers to the retailers to the government to the scientists and even the public themselves all had a vested interest in what food products were and how they were legitimized. Well, this really blew me away because uh, I, I did not realize how complex things became back then and uh, how we are probably dealing with the, those things with the same, let's say, uh, maybe not passion, but with with the, with a less understanding maybe than we had back then, uh, and taking things for granted, uh, like that food will always come to the supermarkets. And if COVID crisis uh, taught us anything, is definitely that that uh, does not mean that they that the food will always come to the markets. Or uh, on your end of the world, uh, it could mean that one political decision like Brexit could impact the way uh, not only uh, food but also, for example, um, the fuel. Uh, can all of a sudden stop to uh, to come? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I and in and things that we take for granted as being, say, British food. So we have a product that most of Europe can't understand why we eat it, um, called Marmite, uh, which is a, a very dense spread you put on bread, and and it's always been considered a British food product, and yet we found with um, supply chain issues with COVID and everything and, and Brexit that suddenly we couldn't get hold of Marmite because actually that very British food product wasn't even made in Britain anymore. It was made in the Netherlands. So I, I think COVID and for us Brexit has um, made the public realise just how globalised the food market is now. Carol, and I'm curious to understand, did learning and studying about food change the way you consume the food? Interesting question, because I don't know that it did. It has, what, the, what, one of the biggest things it made me realise was that what we consider to be safe, healthy food actually changes all the time. And, and I think I had a sense of that from my own um, life on earth as it were in that I've seen products like say margarine um, go from being a healthy product to an unhealthy product back to being a healthy product because they put in vitamins and things um, and um, and then back to being a non-healthy product when the dairy industry say butter's much better for you and margarine is highly processed so I see I've seen as a consumer I had an awareness of that um, the sort of in and outs of food fashion, as it were. But actually going back and looking at the history of food, I've seen just really ha how that's always been the case. So if, for example, you take the 19th century, um, it margarine was invented in order to give more fat to working people because they didn't have enough fat in their diet. Um, now we've got to the stage where actually fat is considered to be something you don't want in your diet. So whereas the milk watering down of milk, say, in the 19th century was considered terrible because actually watering down the milk takes a lot of the nutrients out of the milk um, and that for a lot of people then milk was a 
very important part of their diet. Nowadays, we have a premium on skimmed milk because we don't want milk with too much fat in it. So so actually, in, in a sense, looking at the history of food confirmed some of the things I probably sensed anyway as a consumer, um, but have really embedded to me that insight that actually how we define food and how we think of food is a changing feast, as it were. That's a quite interesting observation, uh, but I fully concur that um, definitely food uh, is a is a kind of fashion, if I can say it so, uh, and it changes all the time. Uh, but we just need to realize what is good for us and maybe go into the direction of intuitive eating and eating what we believe is good for us because we also feel uh, if we eat, for example, too much meat or if we eat less vegetables, if that's good for us or not. I, I agree. I mean, I, I think the phrase everything in moderation is good to use in so many aspects of life and, and certainly in food. I think you, you, you just need to uh, recognize that a little bit of everything is probably better than um, too much of anything. Although I would say I, I, I've always... I've always tried not to eat too much processed food generally. Um, but I think that's a matter of taste as well as actually knowledge that um, fre- if you can eat your food as fresh and, and as possible, um, it tastes better and is probably better for you. Caroline, you already told us um, that the way we consume food today is a fashion and it changes, it comes back and forth on the example of uh, margarine that you, you already told us. Based on these trends and based on the history of food you are studying, um, can you maybe summarize under three biggest learnings you have managed to obtain so far, uh, why studying of history, why understanding the history of food is important? Um, okay, so my first one would be what we've just been talking about, the fact that um, there isn't a right or wrong in 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 terms of food, um, and and that things do change and are fluid. Um, the other one would be the recognition of the vested interests in food production, which are huge, um, and they influence what we what we as consumers end up eating, um, and that's really important to remember. Uh, I would say those are the two main issues um and the other one is that actually it it's you know in the past when we've looked at history i mean way back in the past it was all about kings and important people usually men um whereas actually studying foods made me realize that actually to to look at history in terms of the sort of things everybody is involved with um so so something like food is actually a really interesting and valuable way to look at our past and our future that's quite interesting way of thinking about the food you mentioned those vested interests before as well uh during your times uh, when you were a journalist um how have these vested interests changed the way we think about the food throughout the history of 19th and 20th century um ooh, how they changed uh I don't know that actually the the sort of uh, how much vested interest there is in food is really recognised uh, enough. I think it, I think it is starting to be, and I think things like um, international conferences where we look at our world and what is happening to our world. Um, so, for example, the COP twenty six conference we've just had. Um, and the fact that there were this isn't food, but it, it gives you an idea of, of what vested interest means. You know, there were more representatives of the um, fossil industry at that conference than there were of all the other countries combined, effectively. So, so you know, the un, I think there is a much greater public awareness um, of the fact that. Um, how our lives are managed and regulated um, is dependent on 
vested interests of which there are many it's not just the manufacturers or the people making money out of it it, it it's we're all we've all got a vested interest i think that's that's the right word that you put it there um it's not that vested interests of someone else are more influential it's just that they are more engaging and relatable for someone who is making the key decisions yeah. uh, and the rhetorics that was used for 30 40 years ago or even up until the few years ago where we were saying okay um in case of environmental crisis and environmental policy issues this is not going to work um this is going to, to damage people it's it's not working anymore so those groups representing these vested interests as well need a different kind of communication that will work for everyone and especially work for those that are making key uh, decisions yeah do you think our children will judge us uh, for the way we consume food in 21st century i think they already are <laughs> i know my kids do when they when they uh, well they're all grown up now but when they come home um they, there are comments about what i'm eating or what i'm not eating and the fact i only have dairy milk in my fridge and not oat milk or almond milk or any other combinations so so i i think we are being judged by um young people now um and it's interesting because you know vegetarianism um and veganism had increased um anyway and i i think primarily because of a human animal rights issue you know people were concerned about how we kept animals and why we kept animals and the conditions they were killed and in um had led to an increase in vegetarianism and veganism and i think now that's increasing dramatically because of the issues surrounding climate change um, and the fact that uh, land use and land management is we know it will be critical to how uh, we um, sort of stop the the earth heating overheating um, and of course land use management I mean one of the biggest things that the land is used for is growing food um, so that that judgment is being made already. Um, so it's sort of up to us now as to what we do in terms of um, our food production as to how we will be judged later on, if you see what I mean. Um, I think there's an understanding that while we all may love eating avocados, for example, that actually when they're grown as a monocrop, in a country in South America, it can have devastating consequences on that country um, because too much of the land is taken over with one product that's then marketed all over the world. And I think those sorts of understandings are increasing. You named a really right example. So I used to eat at least one avocado a week. Now I think I cut it down to once a month, if if not every other month, after I, I learned how much water actually is needed to produce uh, or to, to keep one uh, tree of avocado uh, fresh and able to produce fruits. Yeah. Caroline, how can we ensure that we consume the food in such a way that we do not contribute to further deterioration of our environment? Is actually consuming more uh, consciously food the key or uh, are there any other recommendations that you can give to our listeners i i think you've hit the main one which is just be aware of what you're consuming where it's coming from um how it's being grown how it's being sold um who are the sort of profit makers in that whole chain um and is there enough profit being you know given to the people growing the product and their and their will and therefore their ability to tend to their earth and their land as much as just putting the product out there um so i think that is the main one it is that consciousness and and also i would actually say um i mean we in a way we're f amazingly blessed when i look back as a child what was available to eat and my the, our palates were very limited and when i look back at my grand but but they were much i had much more choice than say my grandmother um, and now the choice is huge, but actually I find I eat now much more produce that's in season and that's grown locally to me. Um, and that's a choice thing for, uh, in order to protect the planet, but actually because the food is so much nicer when you can 
say in Britain only eat strawberries in June or July, it makes them so taste so much nicer because they're they're then a treat. So I think eating locally produced food when it's in season, um, I would really recommend actually as a way forward. I fully agree with you. And I actually think that too much choice can lead to the fact that people um, are confused, confused and do not exactly. And they do not wish to explore some other things and try some new fruits or vegetables uh, or even to try some other type of, of meat. So how many people do you know in your close surrounding that if you would serve them turkey, uh, they would love turkey, but uh, they would think it, it's uh, chicken. And if you tell them, like, uh, okay, this is turkey, they would probably not even consider trying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, there have been, in the history of food, there have been lots of interesting experiments where people have been given food that have maybe has been dyed a different color from what it normally is. And, and, and so they have no concept of what they're actually eating. Um, I think that is also also an important thing to notice. People have lost the touch with what they should be eating. And you have people like using a lunch break to eat a bag of chips instead of, you know, taking a few minutes to even make a sandwich that maybe is not the best option, but uh, is something uh, where, where which you can make more healthy if you put, I don't know, tuna inside or some salad uh, instead of, uh, you know, just going for the easiest and quickest option. Yeah. Caroline, um, I would love to discuss with you more about the food, but I'm uh, also cautious that uh, we have a limited time today. Uh, so I also want to cover uh, some other topics like philanthropy. Uh, what prompted you to start with your volunteering career, if I can uh, call uh, that career so, uh, and become a philanthropist in a way? Um, I, I think my I was... Um what we'd say in the UK, forces kids. So my dad was in the Air Force, which meant we moved every three years. And my husband is an engineer and we got posted in different places across the country and in Europe. So so until I was, until I had my own children, I literally had never lived in one place for more than three years. And, and my dream was to get set ever since being a child was to get settled in a community and as soon as that happened um i i actually realized in order to be part of a community um particularly as a sort of newcomer originally um i had to get involved in that community so that's what started me volunteering for um various things within the community um and and i i've done it ever since and there is you get so much satisfaction um, by engaging with other people and helping other people. Um, and I would really recommend it to people because until you do it, um, and and you know, lots of people are far they're really busy in their lives, so actually, and it's very difficult to do. But if you can make a small time, even if it's only an hour a week, to engage with people who are maybe less fortunate than you or, or just need a bit of extra help in whatever way. It is so rewarding um, and enjoyable. So so it's not just being altruistic. It's actually, you know, getting something out of it yourself. Exactly. So uh, giving to give, but also receiving those lessons of, of, of giving and making sure uh, that you are recognized as, as not recognized maybe uh, by external environment, but recognized by yourself as someone who is willing to uh, give time and yeah. give his or her knowledge to uh, the greater cause. Yeah. And and it's really, it's really nice to sort of give your knowledge to other people, what, whatever it is, because it may just be the knowledge you've acquired from, you know, getting to the age of 50. Uh, so which you think is not particularly impressive, but but actually just giving a younger person encouragement um, is so important, I think. Exactly. We would all love to uh, say something to the younger version of ourselves, uh, but unfortunately that is not possible according to the state of uh, scientific affairs today. Maybe it will be possible in 20, 30 years, uh, but it's important also to listen to advice of someone else who has been through the same, uh, if not uh, if, through similar, if not the same situation uh, like you're going through today. Yeah. Caroline, could you name your favorite social project on which you have worked so far? Okay, well, my favorite um, is definitely my work that I've been done, doing with my local community on um, facing the risks of climate change. Where I live is a very low-lying peninsula on the coast. So 
um, the highest area is about five meters above sea level. Um, so we are very vulnerable to sea level rises. At, and because we're a fat, flat coastal plain, we absorb all the water that comes off the hills behind us. So there's a lot of flooding and issues like that. Um, and about 20 years ago, I got involved um, with a actually a friend of mine whose kids were at the same nursery school. Um, she was a Dutch spatial planner. Um, so obviously the Netherlands is a country that is much of it is actually under below sea level. So it's faced the prospect of having to protect itself from the sea for centuries. Um, and obviously with my knowledge as a journalist, having written about climate change since the 1980s, both of us were acutely aware of the issues where we of the peninsula where we lived you know that that we were already experiencing but would get worse in the future so we began uh, a project um, where we started talking to the local authorities and the environment agency just to get some understanding of what their long-term plans for our coastline were and it became increasingly apparent that actually um there were no integrated long-term plans. And so when we started expressing concern about that and suggesting ways forward, we suddenly realised that we were being viewed as basically housewives and mums. Um, And even though we had different expertise in that area, so me from the risk management side and the climate change side and my friend Rene from the planning side, we weren't being... View, we were being viewed purely as residents and at that point we thought we need to get other people in who are perceived as experts to convince them that something needs to be done so we organized a five-day workshop in which we brought in um, about 20 well a total about 30 experts mainly from the Netherlands but also from the UK um, people involved in coastal management water management ecology and planning to look at our peninsula and say, look, you know, how would you design this peninsula to withstand climate change over the next 200 years? Um, And we literally encouraged them in sort of groups of mixed disciplinary teams to brainstorm and come up with ideas of protecting the um, economy and the environment and the social well-being of the communities in our area and they came up with all sorts of um, ideas but the one thing they all agreed on was to actually stop fighting the sea um, and actually let the sea in to the areas where you could where there was just sort of um, farming behind rather than people's homes um, and that eventually led to um, Medmarie, which is was when it opened um, Europe's largest coastal realignment scheme. And actually, I was so thrilled because it was recognised at COP26 um, in the last week or so, um, twice, one in a film that was made, um, which highlighted wetlands in uh, China, uh, South Korea and the Caribbean and our Medmary realignment scheme. And then the other was um, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature um, chose Medmary as the example um, for which it sort of based its new categorization of um, how you measure um, nature-based solutions. So it became the sort of global standard for nature-based solutions um, to which governments, businesses, investors and communities and NGOs can can look to to create other nature-based solutions around the world. So, I mean, that has been, it's been a long journey. We started in, well, we started thinking about this in 1997, so it's taken a long time, but it just shows actually that people normal people can start something and if they stick at it actually you can find something and do something that I mean in our wildest dreams we had never anticipated that happening this is just a great example showing how actually people coming together can work out the best solution uh, whilst also not um, going against the nature Exactly. Because what is also important is that we cannot fight the nature, 
we yeah. can live with it. If we decide to fight the nature, nature is always going to come back to us with a larger force and then yeah. we are going to be in the problem. Yeah, so look, look, we can look to nature for solutions to help protect nature, ironically. Caroline, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Where do you see your discipline, if I can call it so, uh, history of food in 10 years? Will it become even more important on our way to more sustainable world? Um, I think I think definitely it will be. I think the history of food has become, um, in the last two decades, become much more recognized and the lessons that can be learned from it more recognized. Um, and certainly, I think food, food production, what we eat, is so fundamental to um, the future of both humankind but also the planet in general um, that actually the, the history of food and the lessons we can learn from it will increase in terms of recognition and um, being valued. Caroline, any last words, anything you would like to mention before we come to the close? I think the biggest, the biggest lesson I think I've learned in life is um, well, lots, but but to be curious, to be interested, not to give up, and actually to work with people and recognize that everybody has something they can offer, and if you pull it all together, you create something much bigger than than if you all work independently. I fully agree with that, Caroline. Thank you very much for being my guest in the R and D podcast. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, Gravilla.